You know, for the past two months, I've been checking this graph of the Fed's balance sheet and just seeing it soar upwards. The, the balance sheet of the Fed is going up like crazy. And to a lot of people, they say that sounds a lot like quantitative easing. But we have Jerome Powell here. He's here to explain to us how that's not quantitative easing. So I'm going to be taking a look at that a little bit later in the show. We have Steve Eisman here from The Big Short. This is the movie... Um, that, that Krona logged in 2008, the people that were successful in identifying the subprime mortgage crisis and profiting off of it. Steve Eisman, he was played by Steve Carell. His, his character in it is Mark Baum. I'm going to be reacting to this interview because he says a lot of interesting stuff. He talks about different sectors and industries that he thinks are in trouble. He talks about uh, companies that he's shorting, companies that he's long on, and what the Fed is doing and who he thinks that benefits. So I'm going to be going into this as well. And then, of course, we have all these different companies. If you own a lot of different dividend companies like I do, you might want to know which one potentially offers really good value right now, which one is undervalued. And likewise, you might want to know how to avoid buying companies that are overpriced, ones that are overvalued. So I'm going to be going through the steps of how to identify companies that are potentially very undervalued, as well as the flip side, ones that uh, are probably overpurchased might not be the best time to buy the company. We'll be talking about that as well. Now, before jumping into that, I think it's about time that we look at my portfolio and I give a quick update on this. So this is my personal portfolio on M1 Finance. This is my money. The portfolio is real. I started this back at the beginning of 2018. It's actually right at the tail end of 2017. So initial deposit right there was $99, 100 bucks through in. Continually added money. And as I've added money and contributed to this and refined the holdings that I have, the companies that I hold, this portfolio has sped up with the amount of gains that I've had. So, so far it's made $7,000 in gains. But the thing to keep in mind here is that I did not start with $60,000. That's not the initial deposit. I started off with $100. For a long time, this portfolio was under $10,000. So during that time period, it wasn't making a whole lot of money. When your portfolio is only a couple thousand dollars, you can't expect it to be making thousands of dollars. But now you see, as it's been built up over time, just in the past month, the gains are $1,000. That's about as much as I probably made for the first six months of this portfolio. So the amount of gains that it's getting is rapidly increasing. The amount of dividends that I'm earning is rapidly increasing as well. If I look in the past 90 days, that's $500 in dividends. If we go over to the activity feed here that shows these dividends coming in, and I, I filter just by dividends here. So this will show us just the dividends that I've made. And we can look back from October 1st. So the beginning of this month, $2.62 from Broadcom. Coca-Cola paid $2.74. Iron Mountain, I earned this dividend and then I sold the company, paid me 13 bucks. And then so on and so forth. These just go up row after row, dividend after dividend. $11, $2, $3, $2, $6. All these different bonds paid dividends. All these different companies paid me dividends from Merck, Main Street Capital, Occidental Petroleum, Preferred Apartments, Realty Income Corp, Store Capital, these different REITs. So you can see after a while, I really don't pay too much attention to this. I just get used to this money flowing in. I view every one of these companies, whether it's Store Capital or Realty Income Corp, I view them like I have an apartment and that apartment's paying me rent. All of them, they, you know, I charge different amounts and I own different amounts of units in each apartment. Some of them, I have more shares in that company than I do in other companies and they have higher interest rates, just like apartments. Some of them might be premium. You can charge more for them and you have a higher profit margin than other ones. But that's how I view this. All of them are paying me their rent every single quarter or month over month like Realty Income Corp does. And where does that money go? That money gets pooled together in the cash balance. Now, this is where things get interesting. People that have the option of using M1 Finance, they're probably familiar with AutoInvest. AutoInvest for M1 Finance is a unique feature to this specific broker. And you see this giant pie here. Most brokers don't have this functionality where you can go down and you can put everything into these different pies. Like I can say, I want to create a real estate pie. I want to make 20% of my portfolio real estate, then 20% into bonds, and then 12% into finance. I want 14% into healthcare whatever, right? Most brokers, you can't really break things up into percentages. Well, in M1 Finance, you can. And in real estate, even when you go into the pie, like the real estate one here, you can break it up even further into your target allocation. So I want 22% of my real estate pie to be Realty Income Corp. I want 16% to be Well Tower, right? So I can go through and I can set all of this up and I pick the exact percentage I want of each of these holdings. And then any money that I deposit, 
M1 Finance will intelligently invest that money to meet all of these allocations. So their goal in investing your money will keep your companies to their target allocation. What that does is that companies in your portfolio that really race up in price, M1 won't buy more of that company. That means that that company is likely above its target allocation. Instead, M1 will put money into companies that have fallen in value a little bit. And typically that's what you want. You wanna put money in companies that have fallen in value, not which ones are typically racing up in value. Sometimes there's exceptions for that. If a company is really just having tons of trouble and it's going out of business, you don't want to keep throwing money at it, but you get the basic idea. If you have all solid companies, the ones that go down in value a little bit are typically the ones that you want to be putting more money into. Of course, M1 Finance it is a US only broker, but for a lot of people that are in Europe or Australia or Canada, you're not going to have access to this broker. And it's probably going to be a couple years before they expand outside of the US because they're a relatively new company. But luckily, there's other different options. What most people have is brokers that make your holdings look similar to this, where the way that you view your portfolio is it's just a Excel style, just a list top to bottom of all your companies. And it shows the share price, your cost basis, the amount of value you have in it like your gains or losses on it, right? And what that does is for somebody that has a, a bunch of companies, you might have 20 or 30 companies, and you might be going out of all these companies, which one is the best one to buy? If I have a cash balance of $500, enough to buy a couple shares of a, a good company, you know, or one where the share price is really low, I can buy a lot of shares of it. Which one should I buy? Where should I put my money? That is a good question because at any different point, some companies offer great value, some companies don't offer great value. What I'm gonna be doing right now is explaining some of the basic things you can look at to find out which ones out of a big list might offer the best value. So I'll give you a few things to go through here. Let me first start with an example of a company that I bought that at the time, I thought that this was gonna offer very good value. I looked at a lot of different things and I thought, you know, I might be wrong on this, but I think this company offers really good value right now. It turned out that so far it has. It's in my real estate pie. You'll notice that this is one that I've made a good amount of money with, up 22% overall with it. But one of the companies that I've made the most money with, up 50% with it, is Realty Income Corp. This company is one of my biggest holdings. And the reason why is because I felt like at the time that I was buying it, I was buying it at a dip. I was buying it when the share price was low, I don't really know why it was low, but I know that it didn't deserve to be as low as it was. So I bought the company when other people weren't buying it, and now other people are racing to buy this company, and I'm not buying it anymore. I haven't put extra money into this company for a long time. Most of the money I put in it was uh, like a year or two ago. So I'll show you what I looked at to identify when this company was a good value. The first thing you look at is the dividend yield of the company. If I go over to seekingalpha.com here, and I go, O, which is the ticker symbol for Realty Income Corp. Let's go ahead and take a look at the basics of this company. So if we click on dividends here, this shows you the basic. Right now it's yielding 3.49%. That doesn't seem unusually high or unusually low. Right there when I see a REIT that has, you know, around a three and a half, four percent dividend, no red flags have gone up. If a dividend yield of a company is unusually high, somewhere like above 6%, or it's unusually low, like below 1%, you know, that's something that might alert some red flags. You might want to investigate that a little bit more. But 3.5%, that seems about normal. The payout ratio is always really high on REITs. 85% is exactly where it should be. They try to target around 90%. And then it's been paying dividends for 25 years straight. It all looks great, right? If I go to the dividend history here, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this graph. You look at this and it shows a continuous history of paying dividends. Well, of course, when I first bought into this company, I was impressed by the discipline of management to be able to continue to pay dividends all throughout different recessions. So in 2009, when lots of companies were going out of business or you know, cutting their dividends, Realty Income Corp didn't cut anything, continued to pay dividends. But along this path of paying dividends continuously, there's been times where this company has been great to buy, where it's been undervalued, and other times where it's arguably been a little expensive, a little overvalued to buy. If you go over to dividend yield here, here's the first thing you can look at. It is the current yield compared to the company's historical yield. So like I said, right now the company is paying a 3.4% dividend yield. And keep in mind that a lot of people get this confused. Companies, they just pay a standard amount per share in dividends. The yield is a calculation of what the share price is right now compared to the amount of money that they pay. So if you look at this graph down here, this shows the five-year yield. Well, look what's happened here. Do you see how low the yield is compared to where it was just a year ago? 
A year ago, this was yielding above 5%, about 5.2%. And then right now, it's yielding 3.4%. But why is the yield so low right now if the amount of dividends they're paying has only increased? If I go back to this graph, look at that. The dividends are at an all-time high. The monthly dividend, they're paying 22 cents a month per share that you own. That is an all-time high historically for this company, but yet the yield is really low compared to where it was a year ago. It's like 2% lower. So what's going on here? All that means is that the price of this company, the, the cost per share has raced up faster than the dividend has raced up. So they're increasing their dividends, but the share price is going up far quicker than the amount of dividends they're increasing. So what you wanna do is look at both of these graphs together. If you're trying to find whether it's a good time to buy this company, if it's increasing its dividends, everything's going good with the company, but the yield is continuously going down and down and down, that means that the price of the share is going up a lot quicker than the dividend increases they're doing, which can signify that this company might not be a great value right now. When I bought this company, it was early in 2018, the dividend yield was above 5%. I bought it right here. The highest dividend yield that it's had in the past five years. That means that I got really good value because I bought it here and then the share price went up, pushing the dividend yield down and down and down as more and more people bought this company. Meanwhile, I go back to here and you can see what that's done. It's made it so that I've made a lot of money on this one holding that I only had $2,000 in. I made $1,000 on a company that I had $2,000 in. That is a really, really good return, especially in this amount of time. But the way that I did that, again, was buying when the dividend yield was high compared to its historical average, not when it was low. If you go back to all time here, you can see that rarely does this company yield above 5%. Sometimes in 2014 it did. For a little bit, it did in 2015, and then it just slumped back down. There's times where it got over-purchased, and then it went back up above 5%. That's exactly where I purchased, and then the yield went back down. So with this company, as long as it stays, it has the same business model, and it stays just as solid of a company that it is, anytime this company goes above 5%, I'm gonna buy more shares of it. Now keep in mind, all these things that you can look at about uh, buying a company that might be overvalued or undervalued, it's not a sure thing. I could have bought right here when it was above 5% and then it could have kept going up, right? The, the share price could have kept going down. In that case, I would have kept buying more, but you know, I don't know what direction it was gonna go. I didn't know that it was gonna be that good of a decision to buy at that time, but this gives you a good indicator. Look at the dividend yield historically compared to the average of the company. If the dividend yield is unusually low, that means that the company might be overpurchased, right? If the dividend yield is unusually high, that means that the company has gone through some struggle, a lot of people are selling out of it, and you might wanna look into buying it if you think they will recover. There, there might be something systemically wrong with the company. That's when you don't wanna buy it. If the dividend yield is historically high, but there's no good reason why it should be, like in Realty Income Corp, there was no reason why the dividend yield should have been this high. Just, it's just a solid company, no good reason. I could not find a single justification for this company offering this good of a yield, so I purchased it. So that's when you can find good value. It's not a foolproof thing. None of this is an exact foolproof method. There's other things you gotta look at. This is the first indicator that I look at when I try to find companies that might be overvalued or undervalued currently. Now we just looked at a company that I, I showed an example of when it was a good value to buy. Let me look at an example of one of my holdings that might be a little bit overvalued right now. Let's go down here to the tech sector. Let's take a look at Microsoft. Microsoft is a solid company, about as solid as it gets. From all the big tech companies, if you compare it to Amazon, Apple, Google, all those companies, Microsoft has the most diversified revenue stream. They have web hosting, Xbox Live, they have a suite of office products that are very sticky. This company has diversified revenue stream, they have fantastic business model, they're growing into different sectors. So this is not a this is not a judgment that Microsoft is a bad holding to have in your portfolio. Quite the opposite. I think it is an extremely solid company with an extremely bright future. But let's go ahead and look at the actual value that Microsoft offers right now. Let's first take a peek at the stock line of Microsoft, the graph of it. Look at just the past couple years of what this stock has done. It has had exponential increase in value, up to $140 a share. In 2015, it was $42 a share, right? Just four years ago, four or five years ago, 40 bucks a share. In five years, it's worth $140 a share. That is really incredible growth. 
And that might be exciting. You're seeing the company go up and you know, you want to be part of this wave, right? You want to be part of the, the people buying it and seeing it race up. But that should also be cause for concern. If you look at things, you know, market efficiency means that uh, people naturally price things well. Well, human behavior shows that that's not really true. In a market where we have supply and demand, uh, normally when things go down in price, that's when more people buy stuff. If your Walmart is having a sale, if your Costco is having a sale and they're giving iPads half off, you're going to go and buy more than you normally would. You might actually drop and, and buy one of those when you normally wouldn't. That's what happens in normal markets. A lot of times in the stock market, behavior is the exact opposite. As this races up and up and up, people get excited and they buy it when it's more and more expensive. They're spending $140 now to buy the same share that they could have bought for 40 bucks in 2015. So that is normal behavior to get excited about stocks that are racing up in price and buy more of them. So that's something that not in and of itself says that Microsoft is overvalued. But let's go ahead and look at the same dividend yield chart. I bring it up. Let's go to all time. You can see that they've been stepping up their dividends over and over again. Every single year, they've been increasing their company exactly like most really good dividend growth companies do. So you know that they're paying more and more to their shareholders in dividends. For every share that you own, you're getting more and more every single year. 28 cents, 31 cents, 36 cents, 39 cents, 42, 46. For the shares that you bought in 2008, where you got 11 cents a share, now those people are getting 50 cents a share. The amount they're getting paid in dividends has gone up five times from the shares that they bought in 2008. But again, let's go ahead and look at this yield graph here. Look at this. In the five-year time, the yield on this has continually gone down. Just five years ago, there's times where it was 3%, right over here. But now it's gone down all the way down to where it's like 1.3%. So even though this company has continually increased its dividends, the present yield is much lower than it was five years ago. Again, showing the share price for this company has raced up faster than the dividend yield has kept up. So I go over to all time here. You can see that even play out. Historically, Microsoft has always had a dividend of above 2%, somewhere between like 2 2 2.5%, sometimes 3%. That is where it sat most of the time. But then over the past five years, this company has raced up in price and the dividend yield as a result has gone down and down and down. So when do you want to buy these companies? Do you want to buy them when the share price is as high as it's ever been, when it's raced up and the dividend yield is low? Typically, that doesn't mean it's presenting the best value. You wanted to be the shareholder that bought it in 2016. That's who you want to be. If you bought it in 2016, you would see your dividends go up and up and up. As you get those dividend raises, you would have been able to get a lot of bang for your buck and you would have made a lot of capital appreciation right now. Right now, the dividend yield is 1.3%. But again, I'm not saying that Microsoft won't continue to go up in value. It probably will continue to go up in value. But what I'm saying is, as this dividend yield goes further and further down, as the share price goes up and up and up, there's less margin of safety there. You're spending a lot of money per share. There's less to fall back on. There's not as much room for improvement, but there is more room for failure. You know, you're, you're leaving out less room for growth and more room for sharp drops, right? If Microsoft fails to perform or has bad quarters, you're leaving a lot of room for you to see substantial drops in share price. And the higher it gets, the, the harder it is for that company to keep racing up. So that is something to look at there. This is another company that if you buy it right now, you might be buying it at a, at a premium. You're paying a lot per share. So we've already covered two companies that might not offer the best value right now. They're priced pretty highly. We got Microsoft and Realty Income Corp. Let's go ahead and look at a company that I think is a little underpriced. It's on the other end of the spectrum where all the data shows that it is less than what it typically costs. It might offer some good value. If we go over to healthcare here and we take a look at Johnson & Johnson, J&J, &J, if we go over and we look at some of the basic information here, this is some of the basic dividend information on it. 2.86 yield. The payout ratio, is that super high? Is the company struggling to make its dividend? No, the, the payout ratio is 43%. So 43% of Johnson Johnson's net profits are going to pay out their shareholders. That's not a problem. That leaves 60% of their net profits to go and reinvest back into their company. That's plenty right there. If we go to the dividend history, we look at the all time. This company has a perfect dividend history. Just incremental steady increases for the past 20 plus years, just going up and up to where now it's paying 95 cents a share. Every share you own is 95 cents. Now you'd think since this company seems to be stable, it has a low payout ratio, it has a superb dividend history with the dividend constantly rising. You think with that data going on, with the stock price would also be racing up like it has with Microsoft. Well, if we go to the dividend yield here, 
we look at the five-year graph, the dividend yield isn't going down as a result for the stock price going up. In fact, if I go to the all-time here on the dividend yield, it's right around where it usually is. So Johnson Johnson is at, what, 2.74% yield. And historically, it's been around 2.5 to 2.6, you know, 2.6 here. So I'm not saying this company is an amazing buy. What I'm saying is that it might offer a little bit more value than the ones where the dividend yield has continually gone down as a result of the share price going up. Johnson & Johnson right now has a pretty good dividend yield. So why hasn't the share price raced up with this stock? You have to ask that. With other companies, the share price is going up. There's got to be stuff that's causing this to not go up. If you go ahead and you do any searches on the company, you'll see articles like this. J&J's legal challenges mount. The healthcare company faces more than 100,000 lawsuits and is taking many to trial to deter what it sees as frivolous claims. So it's getting sued so many times and J&J is saying, you know what, a lot of these uh, claims we think are money grabs. So we're gonna actually take them to trial and win them to deter other people from doing the same strategy. From a quick lawsuit, if we settle with them, Everybody will want to sue us, so we settle with all of them. So they're actually taking people to trial and winning the lawsuits. They're getting them dismissed. They're taking proactive actions to get rid of these thousands of lawsuits. And you have to ask, is this something that is long-term for Johnson & Johnson? Are they never going to recover from these legal challenges? Or will it be able to recover and could now be a potentially a pretty good value? You've seen the dividend yield drop down to 2.4, the 2.3. Right now, the dividend yield is at a 2.86. That is pretty decent considering where this dividend has been recently. You know, 2.3, 2.3 over here, 2.5. Having it at 2.86 right now, that's pretty good value. I think that it's a decent time to buy Johnson & Johnson. That's not saying that the stock price will just continue to go up from today, but I think over the course of the next five years, you'll be able to look back and see that today was a decent day to buy. That's my guess with it. So you're looking at the news and you're seeing the trouble that's forcing these companies to go down. A lot of times, good companies get their share price slash for reasons that are really short term. For different lawsuits and different products they face that they'll be able to, to get through the lawsuits, they'll be able to settle them or dismiss them, and then the company will move on with its huge monopoly of healthcare products that it sells, right? Warren Buffett calls this buying a dollar with 70 cents, is when you find a really good company that has a low share price for temporary reasons. He talks about that as buying a dollar for 70 cents. You know, what's really intriguing is, is when it goes down a lot. I mean, uh, when, when you're buying dollar bills for, for 60 or 70 cents, which periodically you get a chance to do in stocks, then yeah, you know it. But if we've got excess cash, we'll buy it as fast as we can. So that's what he talks about. He says, I'm spending 60 or 70 cents to buy a dollar. And that's the way that Warren Buffett sees it. If he thinks that these companies are not valued to their intrinsic value, the real value that they have. He thinks that he's literally just spending 60 cents to buy a dollar. And Warren Buffett will try to do that as many times as he can. Does he get every single call right? No, the Kraft Heinz deal, he bought overpriced. Sometimes he missteps and he buys things overpriced. If you do the same strategy, not every single bet that you make is gonna be correct. But the same guidelines are there. Now, speaking of Warren Buffett and the search for undervalued companies, it's reported that Warren Buffett is seeking permission to increase his stake in Bank of America. He already owns 10% of the company. That's the amount that you can own that regulators allow an individual to own of a bank. And he needs special permission to increase his share beyond 10%. So he's trying to do that. But if Warren Buffett's trying to increase his stake in Bank of America, that means that he sees a lot of value in it. If he already owns 10% of a bank, but he wants to buy more of it, there's some reason he thinks it's undervalued. Let's go ahead and take a look at Bank of America. Let's see if the steps that I take to find undervalued companies correlate with what Warren Buffett is looking to purchase right now. Notice that this is news that just came out on the 15th. So this is just like a day or two ago that this came out. Bank of America has a 2.4% starting yield. The payout ratio, is it super high? Is there any reason to be really concerned if they can continue paying their dividend? No, it's 24%. That's a very low payout ratio. So the company can keep the huge majority of its money to reinvest back in its business. It has plenty of leeway to raise dividends. Let's go ahead and look at the dividend history. The past five years, it's continually raised its dividends. Nothing looks bad there. If I go to yield right now, let's take a look at this and see how it is compared to its historical average. It's pretty much the highest that it's been in the last five years. In fact, if we zoom out to all time here, 
there's really not been many times at all where Bank of America, just one time where it's yielding more than it currently is. The 2.42% starting yield, it's the highest it's been historically. This is an extremely good indicator to say, hey, this company might be undervalued. You gotta look at the extenuating circumstances. You gotta see if there's a reason why the company price is down and if that reason is like systemic, if it's something that can't be solved. But that if there's not any huge systemic reason, these companies might offer a lot of value. It's not that many companies right now that their current dividend yield is way above their five to 10 year average. So I think that's a big thing to look at. The other things that you have to look at in addition to this, Look at the starting yield. Look at the payout ratio. If it's a good starting yield, a low payout ratio, has a history of raising dividends, and if the dividend yield is above its five to 10 year average, that's one that you might look at putting in your money as opposed to ones where the dividend yield is really suppressed, way below its five to 10 year average, companies that have high payout ratios, or companies that have really low starting dividends. So these are some of the basic metrics I look at when identifying overvalued and undervalued companies. Okay, well, let's go ahead and talk about some news now. Now, I don't know if you guys got the memo uh, or if you've heard, but the Fed has been increasing its balance sheet pretty drastically in just the past couple weeks. Well, if we look at this, this is since 2008. This is off the federalreserve.gov. And right then, before 2008, before we hit that catastrophic recession, we were holding about $800, $900 billion in total assets on the Federal Reserve sheet. And then we hit recession. We have a credit crunch, right? The fact that nobody wants to lend each other any money. There's no credit available. Everybody's holding on to their money. Nobody wants to give it out to anybody. And so what does the Fed do? The Fed tries to create more fluidity in the market. They inject it with money by purchasing assets. And you can see that spike up right here. And then it continues on all throughout 2009, 2010. We continue the trend. And then they stop the trend right here. And right about 2016, we start quantitative tightening which is the Fed selling its balance sheet, doesn't keep buying treasuries and other debt. And then we get to here, and you notice this notch back up really aggressively. If we zoom in here, you can see the Fed is selling off its balance sheet. This is over the course of like an entire year. And then just in the past month or so, it's gone from about 3 trillion 700 billion to about 4 trillion. So we've gone up $300 billion in just like a month. That's pretty incredible. The Fed is buying like $100 billion worth of assets a week. It's a, a pretty amazing thing to see. Now, of course, if you're like me and you look at this and you see the balance sheet going up that fast, that drastically, where it's hundreds of billions of dollars a week for like months and it's going to continue going on. They showed that they're going to continue increasing the balance sheet. For us simple folk, you and I, we might say, wow, that looks a lot like quantitative easing. That looks a lot like what they did right here, right? It's almost, it's almost a steeper increase right here than when we had QE in 2013. So that's the impression a lot of people get. Now, the Fed is saying that that's not the case. We have Jerome Powell over here telling us that we should not call it quantitative easing because it's for different purposes and reasons. Here's him talking about this and explaining why this drastic and quick paced increase in the balance sheet is not quantitative easing. I want to emphasize that growth of our balance sheet for reserve management purposes should in no way be confused with the large scale asset purchase programs that we deployed after the financial crisis. Neither the recent technical issues nor the purchases of treasury bills we are contemplating to resolve them should materially alter the stance of monetary policy, to which I now turn. Now, he has had to repeat this messaging that what they're doing isn't quantitative easing. He's had to repeat it a lot, almost that, you know, he's, he's almost joked about it at one point that, you know, did I mention this isn't quantitative easing? It's become somewhat of a meme online. A lot of people do not agree with what the, the Fed is doing in the way they're describing it. A lot of people are saying this is a, a caramel caramel situation, right? It's a distinction without a difference that he can call it whatever he wants, but a drastic spike in the balance sheet that is supposed to add fluidity to the market or whatever purposes they're saying. A lot of people are saying that's QE. Now, the Fed has been fighting with this so much that they even had a question and answer released. How does what you're doing right now any different than what you did because of the financial crisis. Why is this not quantitative easing when when you look at the graph here, it looks like a lot of what you've done previously, right? That's what this is answering here. The argument the Fed is giving there is that the reason we did these purchases after 2008 was to affect the economy. It was to make changes in monetary policy. It was to affect the amount of money you guys had, the prices of assets and all these different things. And he's saying the treasury bills announced now, they're not gonna affect the long-term interest rates. You know, they're not there to affect the economy. So that's the distinction they're making there. 
Now, on top of this, we have another thing, the federal funds rate, which I think is a negative thing. It's a negative outlook right now, the way that the federal fund rate's going. The first negative thing is I don't really like seeing this. I like seeing the Federal Reserve being able to do quantitative tightening and lowering its balance sheet. I don't like seeing these drastic spikes in its balance sheet for whatever reasons they have, technicality reasons. That's not something that instills a lot of confidence in me. This having to happen is something that is not a positive in my book. Another thing that's not a positive in my book is the federal funds rate. You can see it dropped down again in 2008 during the recession. We dropped it down to effectively zero, just right above zero. And then it stayed there for a long time. If we zoom in right around 2016, that's when we started doing quantitative tightening as well. The federal funds rate started to increase. And then you look right now, it is right around 2%, a little bit below 2%, the effective federal funds rate. And we have about a 75% chance that the Fed is going to lower the federal funds rate another time this year which will lower the interest rates in your savings accounts. If you have Ally Bank or you know Robinhood cash account or whatever it is, that lowering of that federal funds rate that will probably happen this October, it'll force those interest rates to come down even more. But the rate this is going, we have two things that I think are both negative things for our economic outlook. One of them is the balance sheet increasing. The other one is the federal funds rate going down. Everybody that has those high yield savings accounts all those high yields are going to keep going down. As long as this federal fund rate continues to decline, you'll see Ally Bank, Robinhood, uh, you know, you got all the different accounts where they have the high interest savings. Those numbers are going to have to come down. They're going to be forced to, unless they're funding it some other way. But they're not going to make money off of their deposits if they have this low of an interest rate. You know, on this note, I wanted to look at this interview. It's with Steve Eisman. So he's the reason that I think this is really interesting. If you don't know who Steve Eisman is, or you haven't seen the movie The Big Short, if you're watching my channel and you're, you're interested in the, the content here, I can only assume that you're interested in finance. And I'd recommend watching The Big Short. I think it's a really interesting show that catalogs a few of the people that were able to identify the housing crisis. I've talked about one of them before, Michael Burry, who's a very smart individual. Well, this is Steve Eisman. He's played by Steve Carell in The Big Short. And his name in the movie, I think, is Mark Baum. But he's an interesting guy. He's particularly good at analyzing banks. So he's been spot on with a lot of calls that he's made. And he profited a lot off of shorting banks in 2009. So he's asked a couple of questions here. I'm going to react to him. Are there macro shorts in this market? Are, are there big bubbles? Are there inefficiencies that you see? I, I don't see a systemic uh -huh. problem. I, you know, the banking system is in, is in the best shape of the 30 years I've been analyzing banks. You know, is there going to be a recession next year or the year after? I don't know. I mean, I think we are, we are in a global industrial recession as we speak. Um, that's not the same thing as a recession because industrial companies are about 10 to 15 percent of the economy. But I, I think when the industrial companies report, it'll be pretty universally weak. All right. So on a positive note there, he's saying that our banking system looks great. And he would be the first to tell you, I promise you, he'd be the first to tell you if our banking system was bad. He does not think that the Canadian banking system looks great right now. In fact, he has a very negative outlook on it, and he does not think that the European banking system looks good at all. He has a very negative outlook on that as well. And this isn't somebody that, you know, it's, oh, he's American or whatever, so he's going to favor American banks to the rest of the world and say that they're just as negative. He literally profited off of shorting American banks. So this has nothing to do with any kind of biases like that. He's somebody that analyzes banks. And further in this interview, he's going to talk about why he thinks the banking system here is good, but he's very concerned about Europe. And he has been shorting a European bank heavily and making a lot of money off of it. But he also mentions in that clip that industrials are going to report universal weak numbers. Those are companies like 3M, Caterpillar, Boeing, you know, UPS, those type of companies. I don't have a ton of exposure. Out of my portfolio, I have a small percentage to it. I do have a lot of exposure to financials, so I'm more excited about hearing that he's positive on financials. He's not quite as positive on industrials. Now, the next question that she asks him is about the federal funds rate, exactly what we've just been talking about. You know, the federal funds rate has been lowered and lowered. And what does this do when interest rates are so low, down to 2% and lower than 2%? Does that create different bubbles? Should we be worried about asset price bubbles, you know, index bubbles, that type of thing? Here's his response to it. I mean, are there po pockets of bubbles? I mean, QE to me is what I like to call monetary policy for rich people, meaning it raises asset prices. It has zero impact on the economy. It actually has some, ne some very negative aspects to it. In other words, if you're a saver, 
it's not helping you, it's hurting you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't find QE as helpful to the actual economy. It just causes asset prices to go up. Now, is that a bubble? I mean, the market's not that expensive, so it's not that bubblicious, but it definitely has caused asset prices to go up. Okay. Did you catch what he said there? QE is the monetary policy of the rich. That's exactly what he said. Meaning quantitative easing, what the Fed has been doing for the past eight years, 10 years, he's saying the people that that's primarily benefited are people that own assets. If you own stocks, bonds, rental properties, you have a large amount of assets going into the past 10 years, you've done really well. You've seen your, your net worth double or even triple in some cases, where most people that are, are savers, that are just working to try to make ends meet, all they've seen is the interest rates go down for their savings accounts. You know, they don't have assets that are able to go up in value. And he doesn't think that this QE is actually that stimulatory to the economy. And he actually cites other countries doing same economic policies that it's not really worked out for. So interesting to see his side of it, but I tend to agree with him on this. The next question he's asked about Deutsche Bank. So let's hear what he says about that. Are you still short Deutsche Bank? Still short Deutsche Bank. Okay. Three years and three years in running. He says he's short Deutsche Bank three years in running. Let's go ahead and look at that. So I have the five year chart here pulled up from a Deutsche Bank. It, this bank has not had a good run, right? So we go to the five year chart here. The bank is down about 60%. So again, he knows banks really well. He's probably made boatloads of money off of this position being short this bank. But he says that he's continued to be short this bank, even though it's dropped this much in value. From the all-time high, Deutsche Bank was selling at 151 at one point. Now it's $7 a share, and he's still short. It has already hit record low after record low after record low. The problem Deutsche Bank now suffers from is they're trying, trying to shrink themselves to profitability. And one thing we have learned time and time and time again post-crisis is that's impossible. And so they're going to shrink, and they're going to they're become less profitable, and I think the stock goes even lower, and then we'll see. Does it go under? I mean, this, I mean, this is this all is not happening a funding, as... Banks go out of business for funding issues. Uh -huh. There's no funding issues at, at this time of Deutsche Bank. This is purely a profitability problem. Now, she asks him, you're short Deutsche Bank and you have been for three years. Are you short any other German banks? And he goes, no, not really any other German banks, but I'm short other European banks. You know, he thinks there's a lot of problem with European banks right now. And he goes on to explain them. Well, oh. when, when you take a step back and say, like, can we boil it down to a paragraph or a sentence? Like, what does a bank do for a living? What a bank does for a living is it sells you access to its balance sheet for a price. And so if you want to calculate what's the absolute return of a bank, it's return on assets, the whole balance sheet. Then you just multiply that by the leverage, and you get the ROE. So ROE times L equals ROE. Simple formula. The problem with European banks is that they have sold access to their balance sheets too cheaply for decades. And the ROE has even gone down post-crisis and the leverage has come down for regulatory reasons. And that's the problem with European. Deutsche Bank is just really the extreme example of what, what plagues most European banks all over the continent. One thing I love is when you get guests on shows like this that are this educated in particular subjects and they spent so much time analyzing some things, you can tell, I mean, they're all just kind of silent listening to them because they don't have a ton to add into the conversation. They can tell that he's so far ab above their league with what he's talking about here. And he understands the problem so much more that I feel like a lot of times they don't have a lot of input to give. They're used to just giving these kind of vague, generic information to their viewers. But you have somebody like Steve Eisman that really knows the ins and outs of this. He has strong opinions on it. He's been correct over and over again in these different calls. I actually enjoy seeing people like him on shows like this. I think it's pretty fun to see. Now, she asks about Europe's specific efforts to kind of reinflate their economy with these negative interest rates. He gives his input on that as well. So what, with the ECB trying to reflate there, do you think that... Oh, that's hopeless. It's hopeless. Uh, hopeless. <laughs> uh, QE in, in your... Put it this way. Zero rates or negative rates, what does that mean? I, I think it means it's, it's created global overcapacity because every stock buyback has been done, every deal has been funded, every PE has been funded, every venture capital has been funded, every startup has been funded. And so what you have is global overcapacity and deflation. I think what the ECB is doing is a perfect example of trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. That's the best definition of insanity. 
Now, the next question he gets asked is on a little bit different of a subject. He's talking about IPOs. They're saying, well, all this easy money, has it propped up these different IPOs? Because you've seen WeWork and Uber and these, these different IPOs have a tough time. They ask him what he thinks about that. And I like this part because I just did a video like a week ago talking about a lot of the failed IPOs and how I think that to purchase an IPO, you should wait for one that the company's already profitable, already has a business model in place, not one that's looking for investors to bail it out as soon as they IPO. So here's his take on it. Every single IPO, and I'm not picking on anybody, right. you know, Smile Direct, for example, which is, went, I think it went public at 23, it where did it close today, 10, 11? Um, so I think the public's, appetite, the public's appetite to take private equity out or venture capital out for companies, no matter how good their ultimate business models may be, but that don't make money, I think is, at least for the moment, is done. Now, what's that going to mean for, for um, Silicon Valley? Maybe it'll mean, God forbid, the companies will have to learn how to make money. I really enjoy his answer there that these companies might actually have to learn how to make money and become profitable before they come to the public market, before they have investors try to bail them out. So I like knowing that all the companies that I own, they have proven business models. They're already profitable. I'm not buying these companies that might someday down the road flip a switch and become profitable. Now, the next question he is asked is about specific tech companies that he has a short position on. So a short position meaning that if the stock price goes down, he makes money. So he thinks that these are companies that are either very overvalued or they're going into a bad business model or whatever, it's going to cause that price to go down. It's going to cause the stock price to fall. And I know that out of these two companies, I'm going to make a guess that one of them, a lot of my viewers, and I know from comments and different things I receive that a lot of people are long on this company. They own stock of it. So it's going to be unsettling, I think, to a few people to know that he's short on it because, well, if he's short on a company, it's not exactly the type of position I would want to be long on. Um, some of your other shorts that you've spoken publicly about, Steve, Zillow. Yes. And Tesla. Yes. What is the short? I'm still short both of them. You're still short both of them. Yes. What is the short that you are the most excited about? Now he's going to go specifically into Zillow. And he really has a strong short position on Zillow. It's interesting, if you actually look at the Zillow chart, at one point it was selling at $61 a share. Currently it stands at $32 a share, about. It still has a lot of room to fall, but it's interesting to hear what he has to say about it. Zillow I and think Tesla. Zillow has created for itself perhaps the most dangerous business model that I've seen in a very, very, very long time. Because you know, they started house flipping Because they're themselves. flipping houses. Yeah. And you know, the, the CEO, I think his last name is Barton, is without question a great internet investor. But I think the, the example of Zillow is a case of genius is not always transferable. So you know, for example, you know, some people might think I'm a very good investor, but my wife doesn't think I'm too bright when I come home. Zillow has announced that they are gonna go into home flipping where they're going to use all their algorithms and data to be able to determine the, the real value of a price of a home and they're going to buy it from the seller. So you can go on Zillow and sell your home right now and then they will buy it from you and resell it for a profit. That's the business they're getting into. Obviously, he doesn't think it's going to work out for him. Now, the last thing I'll show of this interview is what company he's actually long on, which one he has a positive outlook on and is invested in. Uh, because we've heard about a lot that he's short Tesla and Zillow, you know, these European banks. He sees a lot of problems all over the place. He's good at identifying problems. But there's one company. This is one that I've never really even heard of. I don't know the company at all. I didn't know anything about it. But he explains why he's long on the company. Um, what's your favorite long? My favorite long is a company called Motorola Solutions, which okay. is a little obscure. Um, but it's not a small cap stock. It makes emergency communication equipment right. for police, firemen, et cetera. You know, what I really like about it is it's very good management. They're well incentivized. It's an oligopoly, it's lightly regulated. Business has gotten better over the last couple of years. I don't have to worry about China. I don't have to worry that much about a recession. It's, kind of, it's, it's about as idiosyncratic a long as you could imagine. So the company he's long on is Motorola Solutions, not a terribly popular company, I don't think, but interesting one there. It is, by the way, a dividend company. So you can go and check that company out. It might be interesting. All right, let's go to questions here. Joseph Carlson show at gmail.com. Joseph Carlson show at gmail.com. First one is from Abby. He says, 
was just having a talk with my dad about me buying a car. This video tipped the scales for me. I don't need it. Um, okay, so he must have been referencing my last video where I talk about how people taking out these $600, $700 a month car loans, it's, you know, super irresponsible with their money. And, you know, it's something that's really destructive to people's wealth and they shouldn't spend money on that type of stuff. Anyway, he says, I'm going to make a better decision and buy nine 60-inch TVs, tie them together and make a 180-inch TV. Uh, so, Abby, um, I think that that's a great decision. I don't really know anything that you could do that is uh, more responsible than buying nine 60-inch TVs, tying them together, and making a 180-inch TV. And it looks like 71 people thumbs up that. So you got a lot of people agreed with you there. Jeremy says, hi, Joseph. I'm a big fan of your YouTube videos. I hope you continue to produce knowledgeable content. I had a quick question on your thoughts about a Roth IRA and kids' college savings. You mentioned that your Roth IRA is a backup source for retirement income and it wasn't made to net max returns. I'm actually fine with that because I like dividend reinvesting and a safer portfolio. We have our first kid on the way and I wanted to start planning for their college if they do attend. My thought was to open up a Roth IRA and also an in-state 529 savings plan. Um, so a 529 savings plan, that is a like in-state college savings plan where you can invest for your kid's college education. And then you you get to use that money tax free if they go to college. Uh, but Jeremy says I would max out the Roth IRA every year and throw a couple thousand into the 529 for tax write off benefits. I thought doing the split may be smarter option because maybe my kids won't attend college. If I have just the 529 plan, I would take a 10% penalty to distribute those funds. If I have a Roth IRA, I can just continue to use that to increase my retirement savings. Maybe my kids will get full scholarships. If the U.S. turns into a more progressive society in the next 19 years, maybe college will be little to no cost. I'm not sure if you have kids yet or know much about 529 plans, but wanted to see what you think of that split plan of using both the Roth IRA and 529 plan. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, Jeremy. Well, first of all, congratulations on the kid that is on the way. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I might differ than like the millennial crowd here that is all about being single, saving money and all that type of thing. But kids are the absolute best, it, especially if they're yours. I will say that other people's kids, not really the best. I never liked babysitting, you know, even if it's like family member and stuff. But when it's your kids, it's different. It's just different. You have a lot more fun with them. Um, I have two kids. I have a four-year-old boy, two-year-old daughter. And they're just awesome. I just played Xbox today with my boy and went on a bike ride with them. And, you know, we go to the store together and it's just really fun. So you're in for a good time, a whole new journey in life. It really, it really makes life interesting. So now having said that, I think you're going to be a good dad because you're already planning out his college education and he's not even born yet. So you got, I mean, you got your priorities in the right place. I think you're going to be a really good parent, especially if you're thinking that far in advance. When I was having my first kid, I was thinking, my goodness, what am I going to do? Am I going to actually enjoy being a dad? And I, you know, I'm going to like this. Lots of questions, lots of things. The last thing I was thinking about was paying for his college education. So you're way ahead of where I was when I had my first kid. But um, as far as your question goes, 529 plans, Roth IRA, should you do a split? Should you favor one over the other? I absolutely think that you should favor the Roth IRA over the 529 plan. Um, as far as the concern of if we become a more progressive society, if we move to where college is completely free, I think it would make sense for our government to say, hey, our 529 plans, we're going to not penalize people for not using that for college that we just made free. That would make sense. Maybe our government won't do that because a lot of things that they do doesn't make sense, but I would have to assume that's what they would do. But as far as the 529 plan versus the Roth IRA, if you should split your money or should you favor one, I definitely think you should max out your Roth IRA before putting any money into a 529 plan. That's the route that I would go. I'd first max out my Roth IRA, then I'd put any extra money that I could into that 529. And the reason why is because to take care of your kid, you should take care of yourself first. Uh, a gift that you can give your kids is not having them have to take care of you when you're older, right? Um, not setting yourself up so that you need to be supported by your kids when you're older. So contribute to your retirement account. And then a lot of people don't know, but Roth IRAs can be used, like you're saying, for college educations without paying the penalty. So if it really comes down to it and later on you want to use your Roth to help your kids' college, you can do that. You have that option available. 
But every year that goes by is another year that you can't contribute to that Roth IRA. It has contribution limits every single year. So the more that you can put into that right away and max that out, I think the better. I think it's a just a, a higher priority than the 529. But I also think it's completely fine after the Roth IRA to start putting money into the 529, start saving up for your kid's college and helping them out that way. Seems like you're going to do just fine. If you're thinking about this stuff already, your kid's a really lucky kid. Judah says, hi, Joseph. What is the biggest improvement M1 Finance needs to do according to you? For me, it would be to allow execution of trades during the open market window. All right, Judah. So in my opinion, obviously I'm biased here, but I would love to see it where you have the pending dividends that are awaiting to be paid. So it shows up in your earned dividends, but it's not in your activity window because they haven't been paid yet. They're in that window of like two to three weeks where you've earned them, but they haven't been paid. I would love to see pending dividends in M1 Finance. The, the dividends that are waiting to be paid, maybe with the date that they're gonna be paid to you, it'd just be awesome to see that because then you'd see the whole assembly line of dividends. You'd see the ones that you've earned, the ones awaiting to be paid, and the ones that have been paid. And having that transparency, seeing that money flow in constantly, I think would be really motivating and a pretty awesome feature to have in M1. So if I was just gonna pick one, that would be the one that I would pick. Okay, well, that's going to be it for this episode. If you want to hang out with me on Discord and talk about investing, you can join the Patreon that's linked in the description of this video. Otherwise, I will see you next time.